Welcome to A Little Bit Radical, a business podcast from Standing on Giants. I'm Rob, your host. Join me as I meet people and organisations who are doing things differently, challenging the status quo and yes, might just be a little bit radical. Quitting your cushy job in management consulting to start growing organic fruit and veg might seem like the most perfect definition of a little bit radical yet. Well, that's exactly what my guest today did in the mid-80s, though when you hear a bit more about that story, it feels like it was always bound to happen. Guy Singh Watson is the founder of Riverford Organic Farms. Now probably the most established name in organic farming in the UK, Riverford continues to innovate and bring little bit radical ideas into being perhaps most notably in 2018, when Guy sold three quarters of the business to its employees. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Guy, welcome to the podcast. Morning, Rob. Happy to be here. So we always start with a little bit radical you. If you are a little bit radical and you're on this podcast, so we know you are, what do you think in your early life set you up for that? Maybe growing up on a farm, you know, it was probably quite an unusual upbringing perhaps not so unusual then I mean from a very early age I wanted to be a farmer and was stomping around in my Wellington boots and always intensely practical I mean I learned how to weld when I was about six I think I think I was the only child to go to primary school with archive because I hadn't used the goggles properly and I always loved making things and I think was pretty kind of creative in that way and just loved you know being outside and on the farm probably my parents were quite influential I mean they were quite in their own ways were also very creative though in they would never have said that I mean uh, my dad was uh, an innovative farmer always wanting to do things in a different way to those around him and you know was viewed as being barking mad by all his neighbours generally thought he wouldn't last five minutes yeah combination of I don't know I think probably some of it's genetic being a bit of a loner I suppose and that opportunity to do sort of practical things because I I, I, that that link between a sort of practical application and creativity and doing things in a different way I think is probably what leads people to be entrepreneurs yeah what sort of things did your oh did my father do differently I mean my well he loved keeping pigs actually that was his sort of passion in his life but he hated keeping them in a way that they were increasingly kept, you know, chained to a wall for three months and then put in a farrowing crate and had three days of freedom before they were chained to the wall again. I mean, it was absolutely brutal. And he was always trying to find a more, I guess you'd say, humane way of keeping his pigs and constantly building new designs of pens and trying to keep them outside in a high rainfall area with the high clay in the soil didn't really work. But he, he never gave up trying. So that was one of goes around animal welfare and he was a very you know after the war he started farming in 1951 being innovative meant using you know lots of agrochemicals and fertilizers he became progressively disenchanted with that so I think reading Rachel Carson's Silent Spring made him start question the way he was farming and he was never an organic farmer but he was sort of on that road and really started questioning what he, what all his neighbours were doing and the effect that was having on the soil, you know, something that has become very fashionable there, but he was well ahead of his time. So yeah, I, I guess I was brought up in a radical way where there was not much respect for convention, really. Now, I heard a story that's a little bit of a radical birthday present. You got a quite radical birthday <laughs> present for your eighth birthday, was it? I was given a pig, yes. You know, go and <laughs> breed with that. Not with that pig. From that Maybe pig. not that radical on a farm, actually. No, probably not that <laughs> radical on a farm, but that pig did have 14 piglets twice a year for most of my childhood. And she was called White 14, actually, which is her ear tag number. That's not very imaginative, is it? But <laughs> so I did start that sort of entrepreneurial journey, started very early on. Believe it or not, my, you know, I sold well rotted manure from the farm gate. That was a good earner, much better than keeping pigs. And I don't know, we picked up apples and sold them to the local cider mill. And, you know, we were encouraged to, as I remember, we didn't have any pocket money. We were encouraged to all have our own little businesses. I'm one of five, you know, from a very early age. And my dad didn't spare us anything. He was always on the verge of bankruptcy. And uh, actually, you know, I think to thrust that upon your children at such a young age, I think was a bit inappropriate. We're all actually, despite taking lots of risks, I would also were quite sort of cautious with money, really, you know, growing up with parents who were, as I say, on the verge of bankruptcy, there was no financial security, though we were perfectly well off from the outside. 
you know, he borrowed money from anyone that he could. And I think he did finally manage to pay it all back or most of it back before he died. So <laughs> he made it in the end, but it was pretty close to the edge a lot of the time. He sounds like my granddad. Yeah. As an adult, do you think you've become more or less radical? And what do you think has been behind that? I think it's probably unusual, but I've definitely become more radical as I've grown older, really, as I've got more and more disenchanted with the way the world's been run around me and and the assumptions that are made about what is human nature, what motivates people, I just think they're so false and so wasteful. And and it really makes me very, very angry, actually. So I'm a bit of an angry old man, but not, you know, because I see just such dreadful governance around me, tearing the country that I love apart. It makes me very upset. And I'm just, you know, like many people, I am really hungry for change. What kind of things are you talking about there? At the root of a lot of it is the grotesque inequality, you know, which has grown and grown and grown over the last 30 years or so. You know, and to hear nurses being told that we can't afford to give them a decent pay rise when they're 20% poorer than they were when this government came into power is just outrageous. Yet at a time when the rich have just got richer and richer and richer, every time I have to recruit someone onto our board, it seems I have to pay more and more and more. No one's questioning that. No one's questioning, or very few people are questioning the rents that are charged by people. Yet, you know, poor people just, you know, it's just completely outrageous. I mean, and how we've come to sort of accept this crap that we hear on the radio every day as being the norm. I mean, it's just, it's not the norm. I mean, somehow a very ideologically dogmatic tiny group of people have managed to get their hands on power in this country and dictate to everyone else how you know everything should be done in a, in a way which is just extraordinary and it's just based on a pack of lies i mean it's just the assumption that the only thing that motivates us all is greed well that may well be the case for boris johnson and jacob rees mogg that is not the case for most people that i know most people you know want to do something worthwhile they want to be part of the solution they want to make the world a better place they want to have the autonomy and control to be able to, you know, do that. And they want to learn how to do what they do better. You know, mastery is the word that's often used. So those are the three things that, in my experience, motivate people. And yes, we are innately greedy to some extent. I mean, it would be ridiculous to deny that utterly. But it is not the most powerful motivator. And there's a whole host of evidence to support what a poor, a poor motivator is. So to build a whole system you know, of governance based on that. I mean, it's just absurd. I mean, how did we get to the state where it was acceptable to almost boast about there being a VIP lane into the back of Downing Street so that people could get corrupt, you know, contracts? For I mean, how did that happen? That anyone would even admit to it, yeah, alone boast about it? I mean, it just seems, it's just, you know, the most grotesque behaviour has become normalised. And you know, I have thought about going into politics. I think it would just tear me apart. It's not something I'm going to do. But I don't see any way that we can change this country in the way that I and I think most other people would like to see without there being, you know, a real change, a political, you know, government's change, which really means, you know, the Tories just just got to go. And, and uh, you know, it's just painful that we're going to have to suffer another two years before we get a chance to change things. Hear, hear, Guy. I was hoping I was going to get one of Guy's famous rants, yeah. and there we go. On question two, we've got one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. I mean, I haven't even gone to the environment. No, I know. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. So we're going to move on to a little bit radical work now. You founded a business in the mid-80s, uh, an organic farm. As far as I've uh, researched, a kind of one-man band. What led you to make that leap and start a business in the first place? Well, I had been working as a management consultant i mean i had in a place of two years moved from you know washing i've been milking cows and went up to london got this job as a management consultant because i had a first from oxford that kind of looked good on their applications and stuff and uh anyway it turned out i was really good at it or maybe i just completely refused to accept anything that i didn't understand that wasn't to my mind common sense and whatever and they seemed to like that i was their sort of in-house maverick that they wheeled out i think and got promoted and promoted and promoted. And I kept on trying to leave because I hated it so much and I hated all the people I was with. And I kept on doubling my salary. So it was just like, I mean, it was just completely ridiculous. I mean, it was the 80s. And then they sent me off to New York to open their New York office. I mean, God, I'd only been milking cows just over a year before that, you know. It was just completely ridiculous. And if you had enough shoulder pads in your suit and stuck 
shoved enough white powder up your nose. You know, you could do anything. It was ridiculous. So it just seemed so morally bankrupt, really. And uh, I did always found business kind of interesting and the ideas and it intellectually sort of stimulating, I suppose. But the actual sort of context for it and the complete lack of morality, certainly at that time, I mean, it might have got marginally better, though just at the moment, I don't see much sign of it. I just hated it. And I, in the end, I just physically, I'm afraid that a lot of the changes in my life just come about when I just can't do it anymore. And I just walked out of the office and tossed the keys into the Hudson River and, and got a job sailing boats or whatever. For, and I did that for a year and came back to the farm I knew by then that I just had to have my own business. I had to be outside, and it almost certainly had to be something to do with food and farming. I just couldn't work for other people. I've had two brief stabs at it, and uh, I'm unemployable. So it had to be my own business. I came back to the farm just for Christmas. There was a lot of talk that our area around Totnes in South Devon is you know, full of sort of radicals, I suppose. It's also intensely conservative, but a bit of a contradiction there. And those radicals were eating organic vegetables. And I started talking to a few enough. And I'd spent my life as a management consultant looking for growth opportunities, new markets, and so on. And I guess I just, you know, my ears pricked up. So you can tell from that that I wasn't really particularly philosophically motivated, not in a way that I was conscious of anyway. I do suspect that there was some sort of subconscious guidance there but it was it was an opportunity to get out in the farm and outside start my own business with very limited capital because you know even though I've been doing an incredibly well-paid job I've blown most of it and so yeah I just plowed up the best field on the farm three acres and started growing vegetables didn't have a clue what I was doing I mean my brother had grown a few vegetables while I was growing up my mother had a garden so I was learning from I had the Royal Horticultural Society's gardening book that was my starting point and there was at that time it's hard to believe pre-Margaret Thatcher but there was ADAS the Agricultural Development and Advisory Service where a bloke would come out and give you advice for free and with that I started selling organic vegetables to a couple of local whole food shops but mostly to green grocers who didn't really care whether it was organic and it was extremely hard work um, you know, I worked absolutely ridiculous hours for the first 10 years or so. But, you know, I made modest profits. I think I turned over £6,000 in the first year and it just grew exponentially from there over 35 years to turning over £100 million, yeah, which was when it became employee-owned. The organic bit came from, I think I did have this kind of from management consultancy. It, it seemed like it might be a growth market. People were talking about it. Seemed, and that you know, I didn't want to sell a commodity. My dad had sold largely milk all his life and a lorry turned up and took this white stuff away and, and he definitely was a price taker, not a price maker. And I wanted to be in some control. So initially that meant it being organic. And then later we went from selling to local shops to wholesalers, to wholesalers in London and then eventually to selling to Waitrose and Sainsbury's. And actually Waitrose in those days were great to sell to, but Sainsbury's were absolutely hideous and, you know, totally bereft of any sort of morality and complete and utter hypocrites. And, and I quickly decided that, you know, this was something that I wanted to avoid at all costs. So by 2001, well, we started selling veg boxes in 93 and that grew quite well. And by 2001, we, I was able to, um, yes, yeah, show Sainsbury's the finger actually, which was very enjoyable. <laughs> When they told me that having agreed to pay me 16p a head for a little gem lettuce, they told me three weeks into the season that they were going to pay me 6p. And I said, oh, well, that's, uh, yeah, no, that's not what you agreed wow. to, is it? And I said, um, so I wonder what the Times are going to think about that. And I did get some journalists involved and they agreed to pay me the 16p. But clearly that was the last season I was going to sell to Sainsbury's. From then on, we've concentrated on the um, veg box scheme. So, I mean, that was obviously totally immoral what they were doing it was an abuse of their market power and the guy who actually was responsible for that i met him later actually he got a job somewhere else and he denied that he ever did that but he certainly did and he was the nicest cuddliest sort of blow you just couldn't imagine him being such a brute i took that as testimony to how you know organizations can corrupt human behavior that you know put in a different environment he thought that behavior was acceptable well, actually, he was a really nice bloke. I mean, he was a little teddy bear. You know, there's some really appalling behavior can become normalized in a, you know, if the culture is, you know, one where everyone else is doing the same sort of thing. And possibly, you know, that's what you get rewarded on, which, of course, as a supermarket buyer, they just get rewarded on how many pence per 
foot of shelf space they can generate in a week. It's really interesting. And I'd love to talk to you more about creating the right source of culture. Oh. Um, but first, I wanted to come back to the veg boxes. So in 1993, when you were delivering veg boxes, you were doing what now and over the last maybe five or 10 years has perhaps been the trendiest area of business strategy, which is direct to consumer and subscriptions. And it sounds like you were doing that before it was a thing. What led you to start selling in yeah. that way and building your business in that way? And how have you seen that whole model evolve over that time? Well, in 1993, to deliver this box of vegetables, which had about, I don't know, 10 or a dozen different vegetables in it, which I had decided which ones, and I had decided the price. The buyer had no power. You know, that was, you know, Maggie Thatcher was in power and the consumer, if you had the money, you had the power, you know, those were the rules of the game. So this was completely flying against all trends. Supermarkets were building hyper stores out of town. You know, the number of SKUs in each store had gone from 20 to 30 to 40,000 users. It's all about choice and consumer power, I suppose. And indeed, home delivery of everything was going, you know, milk was going down pretty radically. You used to be able to, when my mother was, you know, you would have your, your fish and your bread and your milk delivered to the door. You know, all that was going, everyone was going. So it was in every way it flew against the trend. So, you know, you would think... Any management consultant would have told you not to do that, wouldn't it? So, you know, you wouldn't have found anyone who had told you that was the right thing. And indeed, as a management consultant, I thought it was ex-management consultant. I thought it was completely bonkers. But there were these two freaks from the fringes who had a farm up the valley from us that had started doing this. I think one of them had been to Japan and seen it there or something. And they'd been doing it a few years and they said, Guy, this is great. You know, we've got more customers than we want. You know, you're getting screwed by the supermarkets. Why don't you give it a go? And I said, oh, come on. You're just, you're just bonkers. You're a bunch of hippies. It's never going to work. And every time I saw them, they said, come on, you should give this a go. And in the end, they said, come on, why don't you take some of our customers? Because we can't keep up with demand. <laughs> So they did. I mean, I took some of their customers and I knew the first week that I delivered those boxes and I walked up the path and knocked on the door and the reception that I got, you know, when people were actually interested in how those vegetables were grown, who they were grown by, what they tasted like, and really didn't care too much if they had a bit of mud on them or, you know, were irregular in shape and so on. And I just thought, my God, this is so different to dealing with a supermarket buyer. And, you know, within... I think even the first day, I think I knew I was on to something. And I think there's a very good lesson to anyone starting a new business is, is get out there and try and sell something at an early stage. And it's not until you actually have to take the notes, well, credit card these days, out of someone's hand that you really know well, how that person values it or not. You can do as much market research as you like, and it'll tell you something, but it won't tell you the whole story. Yeah, none of my team really wanted to do it. It was a complication by that time. My farm manager, John, he used to love bringing in, you know, big trailer loads of stuff. And he would be singing away as he brought in a trailer load of cabbages or potatoes. Now we're a farming guy, you know, who had finally broken out of this niche of being market gardeners. And they just wanted to do more and more of the same, which I have to say, I found a bit boring. I, I am very easily bored. So I was up for trying something new, but no one else was really. And, and hence, I did pack all the boxes and deliver them all myself for the first two or three years, I think. But it just grew and grew and grew, you know, as the best things do. It didn't need any marketing, didn't sp barely spent a penny. I photocopied some leaflets and somehow managed to get hold of the Friends of the Earth mailing list, which probably would be illegal now. And that's where I started and came up with the idea that, you know, if you find 10 friends, I'll drop all the boxes off at your house and uh, you can have yours free. That answered the marketing problem. It answered a lot of the logistical issues. And actually, they had to collect the money as well, so because there weren't credit cards in those days. And that's how it started. I mean, so it was completely radical, different to what everyone else was doing. And most of it wasn't actually my idea. But I suppose I was savvy enough to spot very quickly the potential of it. I was kind of copying these other people's. Tim and Jan Dean, I should give them a name check. They were the first people to do um, uh, vegetable boxes in the UK, as far as I know, anyway. Well done, Tim and Jan. It sounds like it was a real community-led approach and two things that we really see in our work with communities. Firstly, you going to the door and you're having that real human interaction with the customer is some, somehow a little bit radical for a lot of businesses. But then also that kind of referral scheme, that community-led growth model that you use where you're sort of incentivizing people 
you love this product, spread the word, and I'll reward you and help me build this business with me. Yeah, and that worked very, very well for a number of years. And then we became, we sort of inadvertently fell into franchising. I, To my mind, franchising meant McDonald's and lots of other hideous businesses that I didn't want anything to do. So I, I wouldn't let anyone use the word for a while. <laughs> but there were these people, I remember typically there were people who paid in a band at the weekend and they had a van to haul all their gear around in. And I remember a couple of them saying, come on, guy, let me, I'll go and sell a few vegetables around my village or town or whatever. And, you know, take a margin and so we started doing that and then but they were and i think we ended up with about 10 of them and then i ended up saying well you're all driving all over the place why don't you agree to have a geographical area and wouldn't it be great if you didn't fuck around with the boxes and put non-organic stuff in so and uh, you basically you looked after my brand i suppose and you had a geographical area and wouldn't it be good if we all charged the same and had some of the same systems so you had a business system a brand and a geographical area, and that is franchising. So uh, without knowing it, actually, it took someone else, a guy called Martin, who worked for me, he went off to a conference one day, and he said, you know, there's a name for what you're doing, guys, it's called franchising. And I still wouldn't let him use the word. But anyway, after a few years, we did. And that's how we grew the sales through until quite recently when we started buying the franchises back. I only tell that story because as we became more professional and structured and people had specializations in their roles and whatever, we started that, you know, death by a thousand cuts, you know, in terms of creativity and imagination and autonomy. You know, it starts, and I think progressively from that date in the mid 90s, we've become less imaginative as an organization as we've become larger and as we've become more professional. And, you know, if you can tell me how to avoid that, I mean, maybe I have to go and put up table football tables all over the office and put basketball hoops on the walls or something. I don't know. That's what they always used to show in those American TV shows and the, the, about how create marketing executives work or something. Right. But I don't know. I think it's very difficult to fight that. When we became employee owned, I tried to ban the word professional, actually. I had to accept defeat on that. Cause, wow. No, yeah, no, I, it, it, to me, it represents a whole load of things that I really don't like. You know, obviously to do things well and to do, you know, with competence, I certainly, I revere competence. I've got a bit of a problem with professionalism and as represented by professional bodies, be they lawyers, accountants, bankers or whatever, I think they've been responsible for some of the most the worst abuses, actually, and and the, the least morality. When we hear Moan's lawyers standing up and defending her, you think, oh, really? You're lawyers. You know, we're supposed to re depend on you, and you're just lying? Anyway, sorry, I'm going off the point again. <laughs> you can edit that bit out if you want. Do you think that professionalism is a mask for incompetence? Yes, I do. I do. You know, how did the banking crisis 2008 happen? I mean, come on. You know, how clever do you have to, if you're lending money to people who have no chance of paying it back to buy a house, which is probably going to fall over, that is not a good business practice. And you can wrap it up in as many bundles of bullshit as you like and sell it on to someone else, but that is going to fall over at some point. And someone should have just had the common sense and honesty to recognize that. But it, all that professional bodies supported it on and on and on it went until it brought the whole you know world economy down. So... People hide behind it. And I think lawyers hide behind it. They them some of the most abhorrent behavior. I had to back off with this with my staff because then I know I cause unnecessary offense. I've met some wonderful lawyers and some wonderful accountants, but finance directors have way, way too much power within boards. We do not have a finance director on our board anymore. I mean, thank God. That's quite a radical thing. You know, obviously you need to maintain, you know, the structure within the business. You need competence. You need... But but they don't tend to be the most sort of creative. And I always hoped or assumed that a finance director would be, you know, instrumental in managing risk. But I've yet to find one who's any use at all in that area. I mean, I'm sure they're out there, but I haven't found one. Any finance directors who feel like they fit the bill? <laughs> well, they probably wouldn't want to come and work for me. Fortunately, they don't have to work for me anymore because I have almost no powers. When my coach tells me I must learn to be less gratuitously offensive. So there we go. I apologize quickly when I have been. I probably overstepped the mark there. But there, I do think there is a point of you are just another human being, you know, whether you whatever qualifications mm -hmm. you've got and behave well, you know, you expect the same levels of morality and personal responsibility as everybody else and don't hide behind your kind of professional body. I mean, who reads those things at the end of your annual report were from the firm of accountants who are supposed to be responsible for auditing? That's what you're paying for them. And they write a letter which absolves them of all responsibility and you have to sign it. I mean, what the hell is the point in that? 
It's a bit of a lack of accountability there. Just picking up on what you said, we're both B Corps. Riverford is a, is a B Corp. Stanley Giants is a B Corp. And it feels like what's behind that frustration that you've just had is pervasive in wider business, which is just the over-focusing on the profit P of the three Ps and not the people and planet P. Would that be fair? Well, yes, absolutely. I mean, I mean, let's be honest about it. If you're not a B Corp and you're, you know, you're incorporated, you are legally obliged to run your business more or less solely for the benefit of your shareholders. I mean, that's the law, certainly expectation of shareholders. So let's not expect oil companies to be, you know, to have any morality. Or let's not expect supermarkets to have any morality. They don't give a monkeys about us. You know, they don't give a monkeys about the planet. And let's be honest about it. And let's expect them to behave like that. Let's not expect industries to self-regulate. I mean, you cut out the bullshit. I mean, let's be honest about what capitalism is. And then we might have a better chance of regulating. Clearly, it needs regulating. Some people have found this very frustrating. It's not what they want to spend their lives doing. They don't want to have to apologize to their children and grandchildren for destroying their future. And I think out of that sort of came the B Corp movement, which... I kind of resisted for quite a while. There's another American import. And um, the first meeting I went to, I found very alienated by. But I think it's absolutely brilliant. I never expected the process of certification to be so... You know, it's very difficult if you're trying to certify someone for so many different angles. And that sort of balanced scorecard approach, I think it's very difficult to do that effectively. But I think B Corp do it fantastically well. And I think they, they are really bringing about some pretty substantial changes and uh, yeah i do think it's a fantastic movement and as a part of that you know you do have to change your articles of association such that you don't exist purely to generate profit it is for the three p's as you've just said rob so yeah no i'm a big fan i heard you say in an interview that perhaps the most radical thing about riverford is we don't believe the customer is always right could you tell us a bit more about that yeah is that still radical it probably was but yes, but fundamentally, I don't believe the customer is always right. That assumes that the customer is in, well informed, you know, that they know the relative merits of different vegetables from a culinary point of view at different times of year. And, and we have some fantastic cooks in our customer base, but we also have some quite inexperienced ones. So I think for them to be guided in terms of what to eat at what time of year by someone who knows more about vegetables, and we have a team of chefs, is, is, is seems a reasonable idea to me but then if you start going further than that and looking to it's not just about you it's about the planet and the people that you share that planet with so you look at the environmental impact of those vegetables i mean do you really want to eat tomatoes or worse still peppers grown in a heated greenhouse in the uk which have 10 times the emissions of greenhouse gas emissions associated with trucking peppers from southern europe that haven't been grown with even though clearly the other people don't know that and they're told that local is always best so you know, we did the studies with Exeter University and that was the conclusion. It was, you know, it was absolutely blinding, you know, that we shouldn't sell anything from heated greenhouses. And we don't, we haven't done for 10 years or so. I don't know, the same thing about plastics has driven me up the wall, you know. It is horrible what we're doing to our planet and the disregard that we show by our casual use of plastics. However, it is not the most important issue. And the debate around plastics has driven me up the bloody wall. I mean, we spent half a million pounds a year using compostable plastics, and that was driven by customer demands. Well, I'm fairly confident we could have spent that money better putting up PV or windmills or, you know, getting electric vehicles or something like that, uh, all of which we're doing now, but we could have done it sooner had we not spent that money on plastics. So that was all driven by public demand. And unfortunately, you know, the customer can't possibly be that well informed on all those issues, which means because they're not that well informed, they are then subject to greenwashing. And the kind of popularism that we've seen around environmental issues, as indeed political issues, has been immensely corrupting and driven by, you know, a generation of politicians who, <clears throat> some politicians, in particular Boris Johnson, who have been, you know, bereft of any uh, any sort of personal morality. And I think we've seen a similar thing in business and really cynical uh, use of, of greenwash. And it does so, I think, customers, you know, they are prepared to be led, uh, provided that they trust the person who leads them. And I think at Riverford, we have established a quite extraordinary level of trust, quite often by doing unpopular things. So I'll go back to the example of not buying UK peppers in the winter that was really quite unpopular because at the time everyone was saying uk is best you know tim lang was going on about food miles 
Yeah, so every, you know, it was better to be local. So it was quite brave of us to actually say, no, it's not. But I think by doing that and by doing it again and again, by not declaring a climate emergency immediately when everyone else did and say we're going to be net zero by blah, blah, blah. We took about two years and we didn't say we were going to be net zero until we had a pretty good idea about how we could be net zero. And we really understanding you know, the impact of all those business. So we have established this position of trust where I think a lot of our customers are prepared to be led, i.e. to accept our authority in this area. The, the danger of that for Riverford, and I think it's a danger that we have fallen into a bit, is one of complacency and sometimes arrogance, is that if you are going to adopt that position, my God, you have to make sure that you listen to your customers and that you understand where your product fits into their their lifestyle, you know, how they cook those vegetables, eat them, you know, what their teenage children think of them, whatever. And we don't, as a business, I don't think we spend nearly enough time understanding that. You know, we need to get closer to our customers, you know, whether it is through sort of more conventional market research or whether it's actually getting out and cooking with customers, which is the approach that I favour, is kind of qualitative, deep understanding of where Riverford fits into their lives. Absolutely. So, Guy, you made the little bit radical decision to sell your business or three quarters of it to your employees what was behind that decision and how has it worked out it's four years later it's worked out incredibly well i mean the reason i did it is that i do, I do have this really passionately held belief that we are not motivated primarily by greed we might be motivated by need especially those at the um sharp end of you know the lower earners but i was you know through hard work and a bit of good fortune I had become an immensely wealthy person and I, I just didn't feel right that I was the sole beneficiary of that really and it took about 15 years of considering employee ownership I felt if I had this philosophy that we're not motivated I felt I had to demonstrate it you know and how could I be doing that when I was the sole beneficiary of, of this you know very successful business where you know, I had long ceased to be the you know the most important part of it. You know, it was successful because of all the people who worked within it. I philosophically, morally, and possibly practically wanted to share that with those. And I thought I sat down and I thought, how much can I possibly spend in my life? And I came up with three million quid. You know, you know, even if I bought the boat that I wanted, and you know, everything went really badly. You know, with my kids and stuff, <laughs> I still thought three million quid would be enough. Turns out it is actually really easy to turn spend three million quid. <laughs> um, but anyway, if it had been ten million, that's brilliant. If it had been ten million quid, I'm sure it would have been easy to spend ten million quid. And there's never enough, is it? You know, uh, you know, ask Jacob Rees Mogg. I mean, you know, if it was enough, why don't he pay some bloody tax? It's not people will get obsessed by just accumulating more and more. And I wanted to demonstrate that there was a better way. And I am really pleased with what's happened. You know, I'm immensely proud of Riverford, you know, you will hear me still be, you know, critical as, I don't know, I think it's right and proper to you. It can always be better, but I'm very proud of what it's achieved. I'm very proud of the sort of togetherness. I mean, our sort of motto is we do it our way. So the we is we're stronger together. The do it is the importance of competence and doing everything you do really well. And our way is we won't necessarily follow what everyone else does. We will seek to understand why people do it the way they do it. And then when we may copy it, or we may decide to do it our own way. And that sums up most of the, you know, what has gone into some very deep thought around employee ownership and founders' wishes statements and all the legal documents and shareholders' agreements behind it. And it's gone really well. We did extraordinarily well through COVID. And, you know, a lot of that was down to the you know, dedication of the, of the co-owners. And I have to say, you know, June... Or was it 2018 when we became employee owned was probably my proudest and happiest day of my life. I think it might even have topped my two weddings. So um, yeah, it was um, well, the birth of my four children. So it was <laughs> digging a hole for myself there. Yeah, I'm immensely proud of it. Wow, okay. And I mean, nothing lasts forever. I mean, most businesses don't. I suppose I'm kind of building a sort of utopia or I have done. And then I've gone off to do other things on another farm, which is a bit, even bit more radical again. You know, most utopias don't work, but uh, that doesn't make me want to give up trying. Guy, could every business be employee owned or should every business be employee owned? Speaking of utopias. I really don't see why every business couldn't be employee owned. If the owners of businesses had the confidence to recognise that having another 
10 million isn't going to make them any happier, but actually leaving, you know, doing something worthwhile may be actually the thing that they're most proud of when they're on their deathbed. Every business could be employee owned. It's quite difficult to put a highly valued business at market value into employee ownership. I, you know, you're lumbering it with a load of debt. It's then quite difficult to raise money if you ever need to under employee ownership structures. There are ways that you can, but it becomes pretty difficult, I think. I don't see why not. There's an organization called Mondragon in northern Spain where this is happening on a very, very large scale. I think they've got something like 10,000 employees across, you know, hundreds of businesses now, and it has been immensely uh, successful. So there is a model of, you know, showing how it can work, uh, running in fairly conventional industries. Yeah, so I see no reason why not. I mean, so long as you have well-regulated capitalism, I don't really have a problem with it. I don't have a problem in, with people making a decent profit for making something which is of genuine value. I do have a problem. Well, let's use Moan as an example, you know, who are up, upheld as being, you know, an entrepreneur for just sort of seeing opportunities to make money rather than seeing opportunities to generate value. A genuine entrepreneur sees an opportunity to generate value and then works out a way to make money out of it. These bastards who just destroy in our country with their greed and they're grasping opportunities off you know using political power and corruption to do so and and the growth of the sort of rentier economy which now accounts for i think over 50 percent of gdp you know when i was started business it was 30 percent i think i'm right in saying no i've got that wrong my economy yes sorry it was 30 percent that's about right and wages accounted for 70 percent you know, that somehow that has to stop. You just can't, you know, leave more and more accumulation of GDP and capital value in the hands of fewer and fewer people. We need to find a better way. Of, and it's incredibly difficult to find a model, you know, which short of a revolution, which I'm not advocating, incidentally, despite some of my radical views, you know, it's very difficult to stop that happening. But somehow we do need to find a way. This might be the answer to um, our final questions. We always finish with Little Bit Radical World, so we want to lift you out of your day-to-day, -day, your world on the farm, and look to the outside world. And if you had a magic wand and you could wave it and you could make a change in the world that's a little bit radical, what would that be? I would like to see those with wealth and power and influence, those, you know, those people who can actually make choices, whose day-to-day -day lives are dictated by need, I'd like to see them step up and accept responsibility in a collective world, world rather than just accumulating more and more personal wealth. And you know, I really hope that they can do that in a positive way, you know, using their wealth and influence, because if they don't, I think this country is heading in a very, very dark direction. And, you know, I think we can see it, you know, what's happened over the last six months. And it really is time for people to say enough's enough. You know, and those are the people who have the power at the moment. I mean, hopefully over the next, after the next election, it will be a little bit different. But they really need to step up and do a hell of a lot better. You know, we see organisations such as the dreadfully named Patriotic Millionaires, which is, um, you know, dreadful name. You know, we need to reclaim patriotism to be the values that my parents stood for, who incidentally both fought in the Second World War. A bit funny to hear Boris Johnson trying to emulate Churchill, where he stands for the absolute opposite of what most people fought in the Second World War for. We need to reclaim that patriotism, that collectivism that brought about the birth of the National Health Service and the welfare state. We need to understand that we're in it together. And I think that depends so much on the personal behaviour and example of the wealthy and powerful who have been an immense disappointment to me over the last 10 or 20 years and i think it's time we saw them step up i love that i'm signed up to your campaign guy thank you for that <laughs> i think that's fantastic we've come to the end of our conversation now we always end getting your advice to anyone listening who has a little bit of a radical idea for a business or for their personal life what advice would you give that person to take the next step well, my advice to people starting new businesses is to get out there and do something quickly and on a small scale, which will probably initially fail, but you'll learn a lot from that failure and you'll learn a hell of a lot from actually trying to sell something to someone and understanding whether the product that you have is you know, relevant and suitable to their life situation. I do understand that the world has moved on a lot since I sowed my first leaks back in 1987 <laughs> and that it's perhaps harder for someone starting a you know, tech company where you need a certain critical size 
But as a general rule of thumb, you know, get out there and do something on a small scale rather than working up the ultimate sort of business plan and pursuing huge investment. Yes, if you want to be big, you're going to probably have to do that later on. But get out there and do something and sell something early on if it is at all possible. Great. Guy, thank you so much for appearing on our podcast today. It's been a real privilege to talk to you. And I hope lots of our listeners, if they're not Riverford customers already, will be signing up. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So thanks, Rob. Look forward to speak to you again soon. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed it, please follow us on your podcast platform. If you'd like to appear on A Little Bit Radical or have an idea of someone we should speak to, please email podcast at standingongiants.com or get in touch with me on LinkedIn. You can search Rob Fawkes or search Standing on Giants and you'll find me there. Thank you very much and speak to you next time. Listener.